our target is 401,000 immigrants. Of these, about 60% fall under the economic category, which will help the Canadian economy recover from COVID-19. Looking ahead, Canada plans to welcome 411,000 immigrants in 2022 and 421,000 immigrants in 2023. This works out to almost 1% of our population. I want to give you a chance to, to speak to those Canadians who feel that the government's top priority ought to be its current citizens who are already here as opposed to these new citizens who are not yet here. How would you respond to that? Well, the first thing I would say is you've laid out our immigration plan uh, very clearly, and you're quite right. We do plan to continue to grow. Uh, I will say when I first took the job, uh, I was very excited. I knew it would be a challenging portfolio. I don't think my crystal ball was polished enough to anticipate a once-in-a-century pandemic in COVID-19. And over the course of uh, the past 11 months or so, we have demonstrated that we can keep immigration going by uh, innovating with new policies to keep the corridors, bringing in the workers, the international students to accelerate our economic recovery. We've also added resources at the border so that we can ensure that we are seeing people um, uh, come into Canada in a way that is safe. And I would point out that our quarantining protocols are very effective at that. But uh, just to get to the crux of your question, Steve, you're quite right that when I tabled uh, the immigration plan a little while ago, uh, we had a choice. We could have put a pause. We could have reversed. We could have cut immigration. But I believe, I firmly believe, and our government believes that through immigration, we will continue to grow. And the numbers bear that out. One in three business is, is led by an immigrant, and they in turn employ hundreds of thousands of Canadians. And when you sur survey our, our economy, some of the gaps in the workforce are in our most essential sectors. And I think uh, primarily about our healthcare sector, where right now we have roughly one in three uh, immigrants who are helping to provide those reinforcements to our doctors, our nurses, our personal support workers who are confronting a second wave. And I'll just pause to say a big thank you to them. So we believe that immigration is a way to propel our economy and our prosperity going forward. That's what this plan will do. Having said that, do you think you will have difficulty hitting the targets that you've advanced given the travel restrictions that are in place? And of course, of course, rather, um, the, the not complete closing, but certainly m much tighter uh, Canadian-American border. Well, first, I would say we've taken the decisions that are necessary to protect uh, the health and safety of Canadians. And as I also pointed out, uh, we have been very effective at uh, keeping the virus out while ensuring that we have the workers and the students that we need to keep our economy going. I am confident that we can hit uh, the levels that we have set out in our target. I'm confident because we are innovating at, at, at quantum speeds. Uh, as I pointed out, uh, we have uh, created new policies that allow uh, the people into the country, but in a manner that is safe. I also think we've got a unique opportunity to take a look at the domestic immigration population that is already within our borders. And that is looking at uh, temporary workers who work in uh, the healthcare sector, who work in the building and trades where, you know, I hear from business leaders all the time, how can we transition some of these temporary workers into permanent residency? Because we don't just need them today for the short term, we need them uh, tomorrow to, to, to build up our infrastructure. I think about our hometown here in Toronto where, you know, we're in a housing crunch. Uh, immigrants can help to, uh, to address that by, by building the necessary new additional affordable housing, rapid housing that we need. I've already mentioned uh, the healthcare sector where, you know, we, we see that, that, that without immigration, we would be further strapped uh, for the personnel and the resources to confront the second wave. I think that by, uh, again, examining very carefully the populations that are already here, and I included that as well, our international student population. These are among the best and the brightest who are at the early stages of their lives who have chosen Canada to come and take uh, part in an education. They are uh, very much looking forward to staying and contributing. They too have helped in some of the most essential sectors. So I think we've got an opportunity here to hit those levels. Well, let me just follow up on that because from what I've heard, many students who are from country, countries outside of Canada and who would want to study as international students here haven't come because there's no point in coming to a campus that you can't take classes on and so they've stayed home and are doing their education virtually. If that's the case, and I'm sure it is in many cases, how is that helpful to us? Well, international students uh, contribute over $21.6 billion to our economy. When they're here. When they're here, Minister. Year. And what... 
when they are here, and we have revived a, a pathway to enable them to come back to Canada, again, working very closely with the provincial governments who are responsible for the day-to-day -day administration of our schools. And in addition to that, we've also innovated, Steve. We have uh, created a two-stage process that allows international students to begin their courses abroad online and for those who are here who are already giving back who are stepping up on the front lines of hospitals and long-term uh, care homes again where we desperately need those reinforcements we have created additional work permit flexibility and i will say that this is one of the uh, the great ways in which we are demonstrating our rapid ability to respond to the pandemic and as a result of those innovations we are seeing international students step up give back to their communities and also consider staying long I mean, their status may be temporary, but their contributions are long lasting. And I think it behooves us to ask ourselves whether or not we've got an opportunity to invite them to stay because there are pressing economic reasons uh, to justify it, as well as long term demographic challenges. Okay, let's go back to that stat board we had up at the very beginning. And I want to talk about the 60% of this year's intake falling under the economic category. And to that end, I just wanted to clarify. Do you imagine that will come under the so-called express entry program, or would that include other groups as well, such as migrant workers who, for example, are you know, doing, doing very difficult agricultural work in southwestern Ontario, for example? Well, I think that's a, a perfectly relevant question, uh, given where we are at in the pandemic. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we obviously look forward to the day when we can reopen our borders. We're not there yet. And that does allow us for an opportunity to take a look at temporary workers, uh, you know, right across the continuum of our economy. And I would say that there are workers who possess a range of skills that we need. You mentioned uh, migrant workers. Again, nearly one in two workers in the agricultural sector is a migrant. Uh, they are working under challenging conditions. I'm aware of that. We have provided over $100 million of support to help improve uh, the working conditions, including their lodging to respond to the intrinsic risks that go along with working um, on farms in food processing plants. Do we have an opportunity now to potentially broaden the, the, the pathway for them to become permanent residents? Do we have an opportunity to take a look at our healthcare sector where approximately one in three workers uh, is has come from abroad? Do we have an opportunity to take a look uh, likewise in the tech sector? And you know, here it allows us to look at some of the temporary pathways, for example, like the global skills strategy where we work closely with uh, blue chip companies in the tech sector. We've invited uh, them in to come and apply their trade. Can we also look at transitioning them to permanent residency? And when you combine all of these populations together, um, I think that we will absolutely be in a position to hit uh, our express entry, our economic uh, class targets, which are laid out in our levels plan. Maybe you could help us understand better what the pandemic has done to refugees who are trying to claim status here in Canada during this very, as you point out, once in a century moment in history. Well, this is a tale of two pandemics, and what the uh, what the virus has taught us is that um, if you're a vulnerable population, if you are a refugee or an asylum seeker, or if you are uh, homeless and without shelter, you are far more susceptible to contracting the disease. And so, it is incumbent on us, I think, as a government, uh, to respond to that. And I will say that the United Nations has recognized Canada as the number one resettling country in the world for the last two years. That's something I am very proud of, particularly now as uh, as, as COVID-19 has really uh, put a pressure on our borders. And, you know, look, it's not as though the, the crisis around migration has been in any way abated by COVID-19. It's, if anything, that pressure will continue to mount. So developing, again, a, a way in which we can partner with our international uh, stakeholders, for example, the UN, as well as uh, the IOM has allowed us to continue to resettle the most urgent cases. And in fact, we have resettled approximately 8,000 refugees in 2020, despite the pandemic. And that's not just because of the policies that our government has introduced. It's thanks in large part to the compassion and the unyielding enthusiasm that we see from Canadians themselves, who believe that Canada should be a safe, ref a safe refuge for the world's most vulnerable. And, and certainly, uh, I think that we will be in a position to carry on with that work going forward. I do want to ask you about what so many businesses, institutions, entities in our country at this time have had to do during COVID-19, and that is, of course, go virtual, as you and I are speaking right now. Uh, I want to find out more about what your department's done in that area. You recently launched a new platform for online citizenship applications, starting with a pilot program of, I think, about 5,000 applicants. How's that going so far? 
It's going really well. And in a world that is increasingly virtual, we're leading the way in Canada, especially when it comes to our immigration system. We have the only one where we have moved our citizenship uh, ceremonies uh, online, to my knowledge. And now we're also moving uh, into the digital space when it comes to testing uh, applicants. And look, I, I will say this is, again, one of the most um, special functions that I get to exercise as a minister to have the privilege to welcome people who have come to Canada to build that next chapter in their lives, to welcome their families here, and to see the look in their eye. And, you know, it, it certainly uh, was a, quite a, a, a unique moment when last Canada Day, on July 1st, we held uh, the country's first ever uh, simultaneous virtual citizenship ceremony from coast to coast to coast, made up of uh, healthcare workers, again, you know, uh, welcoming them into the, into the family of our citizenship, but also uh, you know, allowing them to greater give back to our communities at a time when we need the reinforcements in our hospitals, in our long-term care homes. And we're able to do that thanks to our, 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 our uh, efforts to innovate and to leverage technology. And I think we will see that scaled up going forward. Well, let me find out about that, because uh, if you're talking about more than 400,000 immigrants coming in the ensuing years, and you're up to 5,000 on the virtual platform right now, I mean, that's that's pretty small potatoes at this stage of the game, right? Yeah, but let's not forget that we are also uh, going when it comes to our, our landing processes and when it comes to permanent residents. So, for instance, whereas before you needed to meet in person with an immigration officer, we're now conducting those interviews uh, online and in virtual space. Uh, we are allowing more applications to be s submitted digitally. And when you take a step back from each of these individual uh, poly uh, pr processes, my vision for our immigration system going forward is that it is completely virtual and touchless and that each and every one of these steps is integrated so that we uh, become the envy of the world. And we have an advantage. We have a competitive advantage when it comes to our immigration. The OECD has recognized that um, we are the best in class when it comes to integrating newcomers. In fact, one of the last international trips that I took, the last international trip that I took was to Germany, where I was invited by uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel to talk about our express entry program and how we are leveraging our online services to begin to orient newcomers into their communities. And that includes uh, getting them the skills and the, uh, the, the services and the support that they need prior to arrival. And so I think when you combine the, the, the real precedent that we have, plus our uh, intrepid spirit when it comes to innovating going forward, that we will continue to retain that competitive advantage going forward as a result of moving more digital. How much tougher do you think it is for a new immigrant to come to this country in the midst of COVID-19, literally having to arrive here and then, you know, instead of sort of being embraced by the community they come into, uh, they're into quarantine like everybody else. And now, of course, with a new state of emergency in Ontario, they're being told to, to shelter at home and basically have no contact with anybody else. How tough is that? <laughs> I think that in relative terms, it is a small price to pay to come and quarantine for the benefit of your personal safety, the safety of your loved ones, and your broader community and neighborhood in exchange for the opportunity to stay in Canada, to take it up in education, to uh, you know apply a trade uh, in the economy, and to become hopefully one day Canadian. And the reason I say that is because um, you know, we have a shared sense of values in this country that we respect uh, one another for our differences, for our diversity. Uh, that has been one of the bedrocks on which this country has been built, and it has yielded not only in physical and actual bricks and mortar, but it has helped us to build a country that we can all be proud of. And it is that shared sense of, I think, common decency, but also the opportunity to achieve one's potential. And, you know, let's be honest, I mean, we live in an increasingly complex world, I think, Canada is a country that uh, where people cast their eyes abroad look uh, at you with, with, with a, a sense of enthusiasm, notwithstanding the pandemic. And that is in large as we as a government believe in immigration. And we've also responded to the challenges that have been posed by COVID-19. Well, let me follow up with this. If memory serves, there's currently a $530 processing fee uh, for new immigrants and then a $100 right of citizenship fee. And I thought in 2019, your government had pledged to get rid of all that. What's the status of that pledge today? 
We did, and I certainly hope to be able to advance that work. It is part of my mandate letter to help to reduce uh, barriers when it comes to the, uh, the becoming a member of our family of citizenship. Uh, I've, uh, you know, already mentioned the fact that we are uh, reducing some of uh, the, uh, the the challenges and the disruption that has been caused by COVID-19 uh, by moving into virtual and digital space. And, you know, look, in addition to that, when it comes to uh, our immigration system as a whole, um, we have one of the most inviting, open and inclusive uh, systems around the world, which which has been recognized. And that's why, uh, for instance, you know, we get to go abroad and share our best practices. And it's why, frankly, there is such a high demand uh, when it comes to uh, setting our levels. And we are responding to that demand by being ambitious, by believing that uh, the way to accelerate our economic recovery coming out of uh, uh, the pandemic is to chart out a course in conjunction with immigration. That is what our plan will do. But I'm not hearing a commitment from you before the next election to get rid of that fee. Is that right? Well, look, I, I really am enthusiastic about trying to reduce barriers, so stay tuned for more. And, you know, when I have more to say, we'll come back on the show and tell you about it. Good enough. We'll hold you to that. Let me ask you, looking ahead, about the uh, the creation of this municipal nominee program, which is, um, I guess it addresses a longstanding a long-standing problem that we have, which is that the vast majority of new immigrants to Canada are settling in the big cities, when, of course, we need more people in less populated areas. How's that going so far? Well, it's going uh, very well, and we have been engaging with our provincial partners as well as local uh, municipal elected officials and, and business leaders when it comes to the municipal nominee program. Uh, this is the latest iteration of a series of pilots which we have introduced, uh, including, for example, the rural and northern immigration pilot, uh, even more so the Atlantic immigration pilot, which is a, uh, basically a way to attract more newcomers to settle in Atlantic Canada where we are aging more rapidly than anywhere else. Uh, it has been an unqualified success in that part of the country because, uh, again, not only that we have developed this policy, but because local businesses and chambers of commerce have helped to sponsor newcomers who, uh, who have the exact skill set that is required to meet the demands of the communities in which they are uh, arriving. And I think that the municipal nominee program will be the next evolution of a series of pilots that are designed to, as you point out, help distribute population. Because if we never said another word to advertise or promote uh, the big cities like Toronto, Montreal, Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, etc., um, people would still pour in because they have a world-renowned uh, reputation. But, you know, for example... You would know that um, you know uh, that there are many opportunities to to settle in in, in Anaganesh, where, for example, um, you know we've had uh, folks like Tarek Haddad, who had had who was a Syrian refugee who has started a business, uh, Peace by Chocolate, who's now employing many people in that area, and you know that isn't only because of the work of uh, of, of resettling when it comes to sponsoring refugees. It's also because we have the capacity to welcome uh, newcomers through these regional pilots, which do encourage people to look at other opportunities uh, around the country. And look, Steve, you know this as well as I do. We live in one of the most geographically diverse, vast, bountiful countries in the world. Uh, you could pick just about any place on it and find a, a great life. And, that, and that's why, you know, immigration and our regional pilots are so important, part, uh, such an important part of our blueprint. Just in our last 30 seconds here, I wonder if one of the perverse good byproducts of COVID-19 is that more new immigrants actually don't want to live in the very densely populated cities and want to get away from COVID-19 into more sparsely populated areas. Are you seeing that? Well, certainly we would uh, be very uh, inviting of that uh, phenomenon should it occur because, you know, we, we live in a very dense uh, hometown. But I'll say, look, as a son of an immigrant, um, it was a it is uh, an immense privilege to be the Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. And as I think about how we continue to build this country going forward, immigration plays an essential role for our economy, but also to continue to build the country that we want. And, you know, whenever I talk about this subject matter, I talk about how uh, we shouldn't be constrained by our demographics, that our destiny should really be a, a function of uh, our belief in immigration, which is, again, is very much in our DNA. And uh, I look forward to continuing this important work uh, throughout the pandemic and beyond. That's Marco Mendicino, the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, and the MP for Eglinton Lawrence. We're thankful for your time here.